Hey, it's Jeremy from Jeremy.net. I am a comic book artist, writer, creator, self-publisher, and I share my creative process here with you online. If you would like to get additional bonus live streams twice a month, be able to read my comic books online in a digital archive, become a member of an exclusive Discord server where we discuss art process, share tips, tools, feedback, criticism, and more, you can become a Patreon subscriber for as little as $2 a month. Turn over to patreon.com slash Jeremy. It's patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I. And we have one of those bonus live streams coming up this Tuesday. Um, it's a long running series we have called Art Book Study Group, where we crack open some of the best art books around, try to dig in and, and suck out all the knowledge we can. We've been doing a long running series on Walt Reed's The Figure, which we will continue this week. And if you miss it, you can always watch the replay. It's available uh, on uh, Patreon. There's links in the description for this video. If you would like to get a free digital sketchbook, get work in progress animated gifts delivered right to your inbox, blog posts about what I'm reading, what I'm watching, what's inspiring me creatively, you can sign up for my free monthly newsletter at newsletter.jeremy.net. And if you'd like to purchase physical copies of my comic books, or if you read digitally on Comixology or Kindle, you can go to amazon.jeremy.net. They'll forward you to my Amazon author page. You can pick up books like my first graphic novel, Eye of the Gods. It is a psychological thriller about a man cursed with visions he cannot control. You can pick up my most recent project, Morningstar. It tells the story of Lucifer's fall from heaven as a Western. It's an eight-issue series. Volume one contains issues one through four. Volume two contains the conclusion, issues five through eight. Both volumes have extensive back matter. Character sketches, designs, page layouts, photo reference, script excerpts, and more. And if you want to see what's inside the book, on my YouTube homepage, there are book flip-throughs of all of those books. You can flip through and check them out. Uh, links in the description for all of these, unless you're watching on Twitch, in which case there's links on the channel description. So check out all of those if you want to see more of what I have to offer. And now let us get into this week's live stream. So speaking of comics, um, I was having a discussion with a, uh, a subscriber to our channel, and we were talking about comic book storytelling. And he was showing me some of his work, and he told me that he was really excited. His long-term goal is that he wants to make comic books, but he felt like he didn't have any – like he – he has, he's done a bunch of covers, pinups, and I thought they were great illustrations. Uh, but he said he didn't feel comfortable doing interiors yet because he didn't really understand how to do storytelling. Well, I think storytelling is kind of like composition. It's one of those things where you learn by studying and by doing. It's difficult to teach, but it's one of the most important aspects. So it's one of those things where the, I always feel the best ways to do both master studies and then just start making things on your own and then looking at where the things you do on your own fall apart. And, you know, just look at what you do, make mistakes, analyze the mistakes, then try to do it better. And who better to study storytelling from than one of the comic book medium, medium's masters, John Byrne. Particularly, I took a look at one of the best uh, storylines. I know that Dark Phoenix is usually kind of held as the high bar for John Byrne X-Men, but I personally have always been drawn to Days of Future's Past. So what I did here was I picked a sequence of five pages, and we're not going to get through probably the whole five-page sequence, but I picked five pages, five continuous pages, a five-page scene, and it's a fight scene. There's, you know, different types of storytelling you can learn from conversational scenes, from car chases, from characters transitioning from one place to the other. And John Byrne is a master at all of them. And I thought, very simply, let's start with a fight scene and break down John Byrne's choreography. So this is a master study in storytelling, looking at John Byrne's Days of Futures Past. So we have a scene here, and this is literally a couple of pages into the second half of Days of Futures Past, where um, Kitty Pride has the mind of... Uh, her version from the future, even though she's back in the, the past with the modern day X-Men where no one's alive. If you guys have seen the movie Days of Futures Past, it's loosely based on this comic where horrible war with humanity in the future. The X-Men have uh, 
been almost completely wiped out. Mutants in general have been persecuted. And uh, yeah, let me switch to a brush that will do what I need here. Yeah, let me go to my go to brush here. So what I'm going to do here, my goal is simply to loosely sketch out the storytelling that's happening in this page. And it is not to, I'm not going to do like a full detailed rendering. I'm really just going to do stick figures and boxes and where, where possible, simple horizon lines. My goal in this is to understand the storytelling, where they're placing the characters, the composition, how the characters are interacting with each other. And the idea of doing such a simple study is specifically because the underpinnings, I want to make the point with these studies that rendering and anatomy and lighting is one whole very complicated, that's not parallel. Why is this not snapping? Well, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, my point here is that storytelling itself is a very, you know, it's a complicated topic, but the underpinnings, the DNA of what makes a good page, what makes a page a good story, that can be conveyed with just boxes and stick figures. The rendering is a whole different complex problem, but just working out the storytelling, stick figures and boxes, figuring out perspective, Figuring out the gesture that the figures are, uh, the gestures of the actions the figures are, uh, are partaking of, the actions they're performing. That's really what it comes down to. So, let's see here. Amar's in the chat. How you doing? We're doing some master studies of John Byrne, and we're studying not the drawing, but the storytelling. So I'm doing a kind of a little exercise where I'm running through a scene of X-Men pages from uh, John Byrne's Days of Futures Past. So I'm trying to very simply block in here the rib cage that's kind of turning away. And for most of these, I won't even necessarily get into that much anatomy, it's really just more the gesture of the figure. But this turning that she's going through is important in the sense that her eye line, where she's looking, is part of the story. So let's see here. Amar says, uh, this type of stuff is great for channels to break down how to tell uh, stories effectively in comics. So it's like a great new series of videos. You know what? Well, we'll see how it goes over. I figure I'll start with this. And if it uh, if people like it and it's interesting, then I will do more. Now, in trying to figure out the horizon here, that's actually usually what I like to start with. And the only reason why I'm starting with Kitty in the beginning is because she is the largest thing. So she's kind of the anchor of the whole scene. Because more often than not, usually I like to start from the background and work forward and kind of place everything. But, you know, placing everything around whatever is the largest thing in the scene is also a standard approach that I use. So once I've got Kitty kind of loosely blocked in here as a stick figure, so I've got her running... You know, she's kind of surveying the whole scene. So from here, figuring it out, 
The next thing I want to look at is about where the horizon line is. And if you look, there's some, an idea in visual storytelling that's called um, hanging figures on the horizon. And that's just wherever the horizon line is. Like if the horizon line is at the eye level, then all of the characters, no matter what size they are, the, the horizon should run through the eyes of all the characters. So if you have characters way back in the distance, they'll, they'll be tiny and they'll be up in the air. But that will give you a sense of where the ground is and where everything is in relation to them. Um, so in this, but you can do that with any part of the body. You can do that with the waist. You can do that with the knees. So I'm trying to look here and see what's about the uh, consistent area that tends to be the same. Now, people's feet generally don't vary in height. So if you can see that kitty's feet, honestly, it almost looks like the ground plane that kitty's standing on is the horizon. Because if you look at kitty's ankles, real quick, you can see her ankles are way up here. And then you see Pyro in the background, his ankles are way down there. So if all of these things, my, my point is about hanging a certain body part on the horizon, you see that everyone's feet are on the ground and everyone's feet in this scene seem to be about even. So really the horizon line is down here. Let's see here. Amar asks, uh, did, you see, uh, did you see my take on AI with information I shared on Discord? You know what, Amar? I did see it. I, I haven't had a chance to... Um, to post any feedback, not feedback, but just re reply to the comment and give you my thoughts. Um, I saw it. I actually think that um, that Mid Journey is going to be a great tool for uh, for artists. Um, some people are are bemoaning it, saying that it's going to like you know what's the point in learning to draw or paint? And we're always going to need people who actually are skilled at the actual craft of a uh, of visual storytelling and image making. But I feel like it's like the most advanced Photoshop filter ever. Like people have always said, I wish there was just a, a comic book page button. Well, now there's a comic book page button. You just put in your prompts. Um, I myself have, um, I signed up for the, uh, for the Mid Journey beta. And, you know, I got the, the email for it, I don't know, weeks ago. And it's not that I'm not interested. I'm very interested, but I just haven't had time. Um, so I'm looking forward to playing around this technology, just like uh, like so many other people are doing. And I've seen um, different artists whose newsletters I'm subscribed to, playing with the technology. And, you know, it's just something that's going to make the act of creating art. I think it's just going to make creating art easier. It doesn't mean that the... doesn't mean that creativity is going to be taken out of human hands because one the AI is only as good as the prompt the programming but also only as good as the prompts that are fed to the the creators that that the creators feed to the AI so the AI is only as good as the prompts you give it and then once it creates our work you still need to have an artistic eye you still need to have an aesthetic to decide this is good, this is bad. The AI is giving me what I want. No, I need to ask it for something different. So you still need to have a level of artistic education and understanding of creativity to properly use it. It's just another tool. So those are my thoughts and feelings on it. Um, I know you sound like you were very gung-ho on it. And given the fact that you want to build a, an entertainment storytelling empire, I think having AI tools to allow you to focus on building your business and letting the, the AI maybe handle some of the, the art making parts. I think that it's like perfect for you. So I want to play around with it. Um, I'm signed up. I just haven't had time. So, but that's, that's my, uh, my thoughts so far. So let's see here. Yeah. Amar says, um, Dolly and mid journey will change the game for artists, animators and comic book artists. He says, uh, you can do amazing things, and now it opens the door because you can do endless styles and testing a whole lot faster. And he said, I think uh, it's 360 um, for a year subscription. It's going to go up. 
Wow. Discord server has almost a million followers. That is very, very impressive. Um, yeah, I really want to get on there just to play with the beta. I don't know if I'm going to necessarily jump into, like, getting the subscription right away. It really just depends on uh, me trying it and seeing what uh, what I think. And if it's something that I really feel like, oh, I'm going to need this art tool, then who knows? I probably will. Now, I'm getting off on a, a tangent here. One of the things that I'm doing, and I'm not nailing John Byrne's story, comp I'm not nailing his composition perfectly, but one of the things in composition is looking at how forms relate to each other in space. So I'm using that rock that's being tossed through the air. Wolverine is on top of a rock that's being thrown by a character named Avalanche. That's this gray guy down here. Avalanche has the power to basically move Earth. Um, he's like an earthbender. In fact, that's exactly what he is. He's an earthbender. Um, really, it's funny. You can just think about the X-Men in terms of Avatar, whatever they're, you know, Storm being a, well, she's a weatherbender. So she's kind of a mix of an air and a, air and a waterbender. Um, but also she can do lightning. I, mean, I don't know if there's lightning benders in Avatar. I still haven't finished watch. I still haven't finished watching Avatar. It's on my list, my huge list of things to do. Um, tangent, sorry. The point is, is that I'm using Kitty Pride as the anchor of this entire page. Is she's the largest figure, and I'm using her to compare where everything else is. So Wolverine is kind of floating, and I note the rock he's standing on is just below her elbow. His head is a little bit above her head. So that's how I I place Wolverine in comparison. Then dropping down a little bit below is uh, the body. I just try to figure out roughly where the body of the blob is. So I'm just going to put a, a box in here. So we got the blob. We've got just for his body, for everything else, his body's going to be a box. The legs are just stick figures. That's the easiest way I find to do these studies. Because I don't want you guys to feel like in studying storytelling that you have to render out every single page. I've done videos where I've shown my thumbnail process, and my thumbnailing process is pretty much what I'm doing here. Just boxes and stick figures and trying to figure out where I want to place everyone. I feel like the blob is even bigger than I drew him here. Like, my blob feels puny in comparison to the way that John Byrne just gives him so much mass. But I don't want to get caught up in the uh, the drawing side of it. I want I'm thinking just about storytelling. So this is also a very very challenging page to do a breakdown of because there's so much going on. The, the challenge of this particular page is that, uh, let me put a little note here, Verizon, or HL, that's usually how, uh, when I see people teaching perspective, that's the, um, you know what, I'll change this line to red, just so you guys know where the horizon is. Because when it comes to storytelling, the horizon is a very, very important tool in working those things out. Um, and it is odd for the horizon to be the ground plane, but there it is. Um, a big part of what the challenge of this page is simply working out how to have all of these figures interacting in such a complex way and still have it make sense. So I'm putting in relationship because in a way this whole scene here the blob colossus wolverine and uh and avalanche they are a store they're a compositional block kitty pride is one compositional block this whole fight scene that's happening here these characters are all overlapping and because they're overlapping they're all visually connected um Colossus is overlapping 
Avalanche. He's also overlapping the Blob. The Blob is overlapping the Stone and Wolverine. So these guys are one visual unit. The next visual unit is Angel and the Fire Demon created by Pyro. So they are all, you know, because they're separated by, you know, really, it comes down to overlap. Because Kitty Pride is kind of overlapping the two figures in the background, but she is still the main compositional unit that's holding this page together. But you've got one compositional unit over here, Kitty Pride dividing the second compositional unit, which is Pyro himself, even though the demon he's creating is above, him fighting Nightcrawler as a separate, separate compositional unit. Now, you could, if you really want to think of it in terms of purely overlap, you could say Kitty Pride and all of the guys on that side are one compositional unit, and then these guys are another compositional unit. But again, I feel like Kitty Pride serves as a dividing anchor between these two scenes that are back here. These two feel like, even though they are a combined image, even though, you know, Pyro is, is fighting two different guys, one above Kitty, one below Kitty, one above Kitty, I feel like these two feel like separate scenes compositionally that are divided by the anchor of Kitty Pride. Let's see here. Back to mid uh, mid journey. Let's see here, Amar says you get about twelve images to create, but what um, what you see it can do just for backgrounds alone is worth the price. He says you can generate um, entire worlds in days versus months and years. And he says, I remember back in the nineties and early two thousands, people seemed like they wanted an easy button for graphic design. Um, he said, what did um, what does this dude? Um, what this does do is minimize the effort it takes to generate ideas, worlds, and backgrounds for characters. It says, I know it will anger traditional and digital artists who spend ages um, to make one drawing, but it is expected because the artists who don't adapt will succumb to uh, changes in the industry. It will be behind the ball when you can do art in any style, even your favorite artist. It says you can master study and get AI um, as the AI gets smarter, get exact results based on your vision. <laughs> so I said a lot, but that's my thoughts. You know, um, I think what it's going to come down to is it's going to make art direction a larger part of the, the creative process. It's not going to be so much, oh, you have to draw this. I think that it's going to be like the, the people who are making the decisions about what to make art. I don't think it's going to make them not need artists anymore. I think that they'll be able to work out what they want. You know, this is what it's going to do. Every artist who has ever worked for someone else has had that experience of, okay, well, what do you want me to do? Um, I don't know. I'll know when I see it. Okay, that question, I'll know, I know when I'll see it. What AI will do is it will put the power of all of those iterations of figuring out what you want into the client's hand. You don't need to mess with it anymore. They can just sit there and figure out and figure out and figure out what they want. But then once they have a clear idea of what they want, then they can come to an artist and say, all right, I tried to get the AI to make exactly what I want. It can't do it. But if you can combine this image, in, if you can do this image in this style, or if you can draw it, you know, if you can show me a T-Rex destroying a city um, that's designed by, by Sid Mead, and the T-Rex is riding a, a spaceship, that's exactly what I want. So can you, can you render that? I think that that's what it will really be great for, is a lot of figuring this stuff out um, instead of wasting the artist's time. Because the fact of the matter is that just because you can do all this stuff, like I look at all the stuff that Mid Journey can do and I see all those things, and most of it is stuff that I don't necessarily want to do. Um, I don't really want to do massive, super rendered cityscapes. Um, hell, the way I see it being useful for comic book artists is backgrounds. 
lot of times you don't necessarily want to draw. I know a lot of artists hate drawing backgrounds. You can just sit there and say, all right, give me a low angled um, image of a coffee shop. You just ask it for backgrounds for uh, in different styles. You can say a, a well lit or a low key lit. You can just say an alley crawling with rats um, in a sci fi um, in a sci fi um, utopia. Um, you can just describe what you want and it'll draw your background for you. And then you can just drop it in and keep working on your artwork. And maybe you drop it in and it's perfect. Or maybe you drop it in and you just drop the opacity and you trace over it and make adjustments and tweaks to make it match your style perfectly. Um, I see it being incredibly useful to, uh, particularly to complex creators in that way. But like you said, Amar, it's just a tool. Um, and yeah, I think it's going to transform the art world, but it's not going to make me want to stop drawing. I think there's some people who, like you said, will be upset um, because they've spent their whole life learning how to make art and this thing can make it in minutes. But the fact of the matter is that I draw because I enjoy drawing. I'm not drawing in service of the story. I'm drawing because I love the act of drawing. So... And if other people don't value the drawings that I make, then so be it. They can go make whatever they want to make. In the end, you're still going to need creativity in order to actually utilize these these uh, these AI tools. That's the uh, the big thing that I see. That's the big takeaway that that I have. So what's interesting about this is just that there's movement. And he's got little motion, you know, motion sweeps. And I'm going to instead use arrows instead of the sweeps. You've got the action. Kitty Pride is obviously running, but she's frozen in space. Let me switch to uh, maybe blue here to show action. So you've got Avalanche gesturing. And his gesture is... Affecting the movement of Wolverine because that's the thing he's controlling. He's controlling this Pete slab of rock that he's on. Meanwhile, you've got Colossus punching in the blob, and the blob is just taking it. The blob is just, you know, that's what he does. Meanwhile, you've got Angel arcing across here. And you've got Nightcrawler. He doesn't have speed lines behind him, but you can tell that he's moving kind of away from Pyro, kind of ducking and dodging out of the way here. So there's a lot going on. I mean, as an opening panel, this is establishing what's going on with all the characters. It's giving you a character geography, but notice there's actually no background. Um, and I think that that's probably a necessity. Who knows? Burn may have sketched in a background. But with so many characters, a background would just make this even more complicated. And maybe, I, you know, I would need to hear John Byrne's actual thoughts because God forbid I speak for him. Um, but I would guess that he probably considered putting a background in here and then quickly realized with all these characters, it's not that you can't have a shot this complicated and have backgrounds. It's more that... It would take that much more time to compose this page and not have it be cluttered because this is already on the verge of clutter, but being a master of composition that and storytelling that John Byrne is, he can, uh, he can come, he can make it work. So like I said, this is a very, very complicated page. Um, but the main thing is showing all of this fight choreography between all of these characters at once. And at the same time, you know, Kitty Pride is serving both as anchor and as proxy for the viewer. She's compositionally dividing up and simplifying what's going on here. And at the same time, She's looking at all storytelling wise. She's serving that purpose, both as composition and as she's looking around, trying to get the lay of what's going on in this fight scene, much like you, the viewer are. And even that 
Notice the fact that her head is turned like she's taking in the fight scene. So the point of these studies is to understand the action, what's going on. Now, the one thing we don't see in this shot is Storm. Um, I picked a, a scene that was sequential, so there was set up before this scene where you might have seen where Storm is. But when you move down, you know, you move down to this next page, you kind of want to see the, the thing is she, John Byrne does tie it all together because he shows you all of these characters. Then he shows you Storm, who is not in this composition, but then he shows you Storm in relationship to all of those characters. She's above them. So you see where the blob is. Storm is somewhere up above either on this side or that side. I'm going to guess because of the way that everyone is getting tossed and also just compositionally she's moving. Her actions are from left to right. I am going to guess that Storm is somewhere over here off screen. She's up above. And she just sees there's chaos going on. I've got to put, I got to shut this shit down. So let's see here. So Amar says, uh, it's funny how many comic artists don't have backgrounds, even uh, from professionals. Um, he says, sometimes you can get away with the storytelling with less. Um, I, well, the point I was trying to make is not that John Byrne is getting away with anything. I don't think he is getting away with anything at all. I have seen how complicated the um, the backgrounds John Byrne can draw and do storytelling with. I think that he is intentionally leaving out the background because it would make this page too cluttered. I don't think you can have all of the fighting that's going on in that first panel and still have a – like I said, you can do it and have a background, but it's going to take a very, very long time to – compose that background so that it doesn't make the page unreadable. And in comics, you know, time is money. So it's not that he's being lazy. He's looking at this and saying, okay, a background is going to make it even harder to tell what's going on in a complicated scene. So he's making an intelligent artistic decision in terms of leave it out. It's going to make things harder. So, it, you know, he's not getting away with anything. He's making a smart compositional decision. That's, very, very important to know. You know, I've done panels before where I've like put in backgrounds and later on looked at it and said, oh, I wish I had not put a background there because it's making this page harder to read. So John Byrne, master storyteller that he is, is, you know, he knows that. He gets that. So Storm appears to be looking in kind of a straightforward sequence I kind of like, in my mind, I kind of want to imagine her looking slightly to the right. Only because her actions are going to be moving to the right. But really, and her eyes are actually important to this composition because eyeline gives you a sense of storytelling. Eyeline, I don't think people necessarily realize how important eyeline is. If you just have a bunch of characters, but they aren't looking at each other then they're not interacting with each other. Um, what the direction the character's looking at and specifically who they're looking at is part of the storytelling. It's part of the storytelling. If you're not doing it, you're, you're not doing your job. You gotta take that into account, the direction the characters are looking. Now, on one hand, I do very much see how having her look to the right would give that sense of, oh, it's continuing the way she's gonna be looking in the next panel. But having her looking straight forward at the viewer is, it makes this shot very intimate. It's very, very intimate. Um, so the idea is almost that you're looking at her, you're, it's almost like in this shot that you're looking at her, it's almost like you are all of the characters down here looking up at what she's looking at you you the viewer become the thing that she's about to be interacting with and uh 
notice Burn also, even though there's a lot of movement in different directions on uh, put in another blue arrow here, Nightcrawler ducking down and trying to get out of the way of Pyro's attack. And Pyro's attack also leading up to, uh, to challenge Angel. It'd be easier if I just put the arrow down here. See, even with the arrows, just with stick figures, this all gets incredibly complicated. And you have to remember, honestly, forget about super detailed rendering. Storytelling is the most important part of comics. And some and that's why, you know, simplifying things as much as possible. I think in 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 my opinion, the only way you can even do really complicated rendering is if the structure, the actual panel, what's going on in the panels is simple. Um, you know, the silhouettes of all these characters are very, very clean. Um, you know, Wolverine, you can read his ears there. Um, the Blob has a very simple costume, but his the fact that he, you know, has that huge belly that most characters don't have You know, he stands out and reads. I'd say, the, honestly, the one who reads the least is probably Avalanche, because he's just a guy in kind of a semi-armored suit with a helmet. Colossus, Nightcrawler, they have very unique silhouettes because of, you know, Colossus is huge and has these little kind of fins on his shoulders. Nightcrawler has fins on his shoulders, but he's also got a tail, which I realize I left his tail off in the little stick figure. The tail is an important part of his silhouette. So you've got Storm here gesturing, but her attention is going towards the viewer. And then you get the effect of her gesture. So we've got her anchored up here in the corner. And another thing that I do when I'm looking at the composition of a panel is I will really just, a lot of times I will just simply look at it as I either divide the panel into, switch back to black here. I'll either divide the panel into thirds. I should do this lighter either into thirds or I'll just divide it into quarters. I think for this particular panel, quarters is easier. Now, this isn't about me figuring out the horizon. This is just me looking at the composition here. So when I look at this, Storm is in the upper quarter and Blob breaks up over that. And then you've kind of got the rest of the characters burst out from the rest. Now, again, in this particular panel, it's hard to see what the horizon is. But if I take a look, you can actually see there's a ground plane here. It's got a little bit of a ground plane. And you can also see, look at the blob's feet. The ground... probably going that way. The ground plane is at an angle. Which is interesting because Storm herself seems kind of upright. But if you take into a fact that the ground plane is at an angle, that actually makes it a lot more dynamic. And Byrne doesn't put in a ton of clutter. He puts in just enough for you to note, you know, to get the subtle uh, effect that he's laying on there. So let's let's just we're not going to obsess over the horizon. We're just going to say the horizon is probably. 
probably somewhere around here. Actually, that's not true at all because we're looking at the top of the blob's head. The horizon actually, I think, Ah, see, I see what he did here. Very clever. You could actually use one of these lines, one of these lines that, um, the lines of uh, Storm's energy that she's blasting as one of the horizon lines. Because if you see, we're looking at the top. We look at the top of the blob's head. When you look at um, Angel, we're actually, you know, the horizon is somewhere around here. When you look at his upper torso, we're kind of looking cube-wise, we're looking up at him. So the horizon is both at an angle. We're also looking down at Storm a little bit. So the horizon actually is running somewhere, somewhere between her head and Angel's head. Mm, no, that's not right either because I'm looking at the the floor, and that it doesn't re it doesn't compare with doesn't compete with that. Let me see what happens if I just follow this. So this line should eventually go and hit the horizon. Maybe the horizon is around here, a little bit lower. Let's try that. Almost like a diagonal cutting across the panel. Let's see. Amaris is in the chat. Hey, welcome back. Good to see you. She says, I've taken a break to build up muscle memory and coordination. So my doctor prescribed knitting to help retrain my hands. I had another accident while recovering from COVID. Uh, let's see here. Well, I'm sorry to hear that uh, that you uh, had another accident. I'm also sorry to hear you had COVID. I've had it. It sucks. Um, I hope that you are doing better and well and continue with your physical therapy. Um, let's see here. So I'm just going to kind of go with this for now. Just a horizon line streaking across there. Fact of the matter is that on this particular panel, I can't quite work out. I'm not going to bullshit you. I can't quite work out where the horizon is because there isn't enough background in here for me to really understand it. But I do know that because the floor is at an angle, the horizon's at an angle. So I'm just going to kind of go from there and start putting in the torsos. So you've just got Storm over here. Now again, overlap. You've got Storm and her leg is extended. And to be honest, I probably should have moved her torso over a little bit. Well, again, hell, this is the beauty of digital. You know, when you're working traditional, you erase and draw again. When you're working digital, you just say, all right, I need this to be a little further over. I need Storm's body to be a little further over only because and a little further down. I'm not taking into account the uh, the space. I'm sort of looking at the picture without taking into account the actual composition with the, uh, the word balloon. Point being is that she is very slightly overlapping the blob. Not by a lot, but just her foot. So we've got the blob over there. Got his feet, as I mentioned, planted firmly on the ground, but sideways. Well, at a Dutch angle. Let's 
So like I said, all of this came from a conversation I was having with a viewer about learning how to do visual storytelling. And the fact that, you know, I said, in order to study storytelling, because he wasn't sure where to start. And I said, it's just stick figures and cylinders and cubes. That's what you need in order to study this stuff. You don't need to draw well to study this. Um, it's funny. Colossus was punching the crap out of the blob before and having no effect. Now the blob, even with his power, is getting pushed almost by Storm. That's how powerful she is. And Colossus is now hanging on to him so he doesn't get blown away. It's kind of a, a humorous visual uh, change from what was going on in the previous, uh, previous at the, the first panel. I wonder if this space in here was colored in and it should have been white because I feel like if this were white, the silhouette would read better. I don't know. Above my pay grade. But anyway, notice all of the overlap that's going on. Storm overlap her foot overlapped by the blob the blob colossus hanging on to him is still a form of overlap they become one visual unit almost like they become one figure so you've got Storm blasting these guys. To be honest, I should probably have her up a little bit higher. This composition feels like she's a little bit higher in the air. Like, you have her foot. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and erase it because it bugs me. This whole thing is studying the storytelling of the composition. It bugs me how bad I did that. So if you look at how high the blob's head is, her torso is above that, which means that as opposed to where I had her, her torso should probably be somewhere up here. I moved her closer, but I overcompensated and moved her too close. Let's see here. Mara says, I'm doing a lot better now. I can hold pencils for 45 minutes without dropping it. Um, says, getting there is a process. Well, you know, you, you stick with it. I'm I'm glad that you're recovering and that you are, are staying with it and you've got some, some good therapies. You know, it sounds like the knitting is helping you. So I am glad to hear that. Anyway, I just wanted to move Storm's leg up a little bit. So point being is that all of the clutter that's going on in the first panel, and when I say clutter, I don't mean visual clutter. I mean combat, chaos, all of that that's going on, Storm comes in and says, chill. So you've got, basically I'm just blocking in the entire blast radius of what Storm is doing. Her energy is all this entire frame. And yes, she, the cape is an important composition in that it gives you the sense of wind whipping around her. But for breaking down what's happening in the story, you don't necessarily, I don't need that at this moment. Because this is, again, to study the storytelling, not necessarily the drawing of John Byrne. I just want to mention the cape because the cape does in a sense, tell a piece of the story, the way that it's whipping around there like a flag around her. You know, and I bet it would be a visual effects nightmare 
But that would actually be really cool in the X-Men movie if, like, Storm always had a breeze. Like, if she was always wearing something flowing, and no matter what, when you looked at her, you could always feel air currents moving around. Like, if they... You know, I'm sure they're going to do more X-Men movies. That's a tip for the producers and a tip for the directors. And for the... Co- well, I don't know. I feel bad. To, I don't, okay. Even for the costume designer. Try to design Storm's costumes so that she's always wearing something flowing and that you can always see movement of air currents around her. Like, she should be a living embodiment of air currents. So now the anchor of this scene in the same of this panel, in the same way that Kitty Pride was the anchor of the uh, the first panel, in a way, this combination of Colossus and Blob becomes the anchor of the second panel in that they are crammed together. Now below that, you get this interesting interplay where you've got Avalanche, he becomes part of this visual unit in that he's being overlaid by Colossus. He's down here, and again, it's just stick figures. He's down here. And maybe because he controls the earth, he's being pushed back. And that's actually an interesting idea. And I can't remember because I haven't reread this story in a while. Um, The idea of a mutant who controls the weather versus a mutant who controls the earth. I feel like Avalanche versus Storm is an interesting battle. If anything, I would bring back Av- I don't I think I feel like Avalanche died somewhere in the comics and I don't know if they brought him back. Um I would like to make Avalanche like that's one of the things I would do is if I were, were writing the X-Men right now, I would bring back Avalanche and make him Storm's like arch enemy. Like he I would make him into Storm's saber tooth. Um you'd have to have a compelling story about how they became bitter enemies. Um, I'm sure we could find something in the, the stories, maybe something where he was a, a miner for blood diamonds in Africa and her being a jewel thief, somehow Storm ran afoul of him and he took it out on maybe some people that Storm was trying to protect. I love how I'm actually already even writing the story. All right, I'm writing a Storm miniseries about how Avalanche is um, is Storm's saber tooth, and then they become just ongoing arch nemeses. But anyway, visually, when I look at this, I feel like the stick figure of Pyro at the bottom. I feel like Pyro is almost part of this visual unit but at the same time pyro makes in this case to me compositionally all three of these feel like they're storm and then everyone getting knocked over by storms they all feel together and it's not so much that these guys are a unit and then the two guys up in the air are a unit to me the way i read this compositionally is that pyro is a transitional form to that ropes angel into the composition so you've got the major part of the composition pyro is so close that pyro feels like he's part of this but in him being part of this that pulls angel in like if you were to just erase pyro out together all together he just wasn't in this panel. Then you might read this as there's all these guys down here and there's this other guy up in the air floating by himself. 
and Angel might read as more separate. But I feel like Pyro serves a storytelling, you know, function, both in terms of just he's a character who was fighting Nightcrawler and now got blown away. Because now you see that Nightcrawler has been separated um, from Pyro. Avalanche, I don't even know where Wolverine is. Probably somewhere. I mean, he, was a, he got thrown somewhere off panel. And plus, you have to remember that you can only fit but so many characters in a given panel. I mean, George Perez was a master at, uh, at the multi-character panel. But it's got its limits. And you have to ask yourself, when you've got a bunch of characters in a panel, what purpose are they serving? Yes, you could probably find a way to cram Wolverine in, into this particular shot, but you don't need to have every single character in every single shot. And that's something that is a good reminder for me. I'm not telling you this like, oh, this is a rule that I know and I'm laying down the law for you guys. I'm saying that doing these stud studies is a reminder and it's it's teaching me as I'm showing you things that I'm observing. I'm re it's reminding me that if I've got a complex scene, you know, I may establish an initial geography. That's kind of the, the larger point of this. In the first panel, we establish a geography of everyone but Storm. We cut the Storm and then we show Storm and we sh continue to show the geography of everyone else's relationship except Wolverine. We don't know what happened to Wolverine. He flew off panel. Um, but the point of my, my little rant here is that it's okay. You're getting the sense of the overall, the overall sense of the story is continuing to flow. So, all right, we've got this and, uh, you know, this is just simple stick figures and like I said, I never did work out exactly where the horizon line is. I'm not going to BS you on it. Um, I think based on just where the where the blob's feet are and where that piece of wall is, you could figure it out. Um, and I do feel now that I, I took a closer look at where we are seeing Avalanche, I do feel like that horizon, yes, he could be tilting away from us. So that's why we're kind of looking at the underside of his torso. But it also feels like that horizon is probably somewhere in here. Or maybe a little bit lower. Maybe right along Colossus's leg. Because I realize now, originally I said that we were looking up at the uh, the blob's head, and that's not true. We're looking at the back of his head. His head is tilted backwards, so we're seeing the top of his head. But we're seeing it because that's the way his head is turned, not because we're looking down on him. So it really does, the more I look at it, it feels like the horizon is somewhere right along Colossus's body. You know, I thought that we were looking down on Storm, but instead we're actually kind of looking almost, she's not too far off of the horizon, maybe a little bit above it, but with her head turned down dramatically. So that is how I break down this page. And I'll tell you what, we're pretty much at about an hour here, but what I'll do is I'll go to the next page and I'll just start sketching out the first panel of the next page. And maybe we'll pick this up next week. Um, you guys let me know in the comments if you're interested in this. And if you are, then uh, I'll do the whole five-page sequence. If not, I'll just finish the next page next week, and we'll call that a day. But these whole things are just what the action is doing and how the characters are composed. Um, to me, this is the essence of comic book storytelling and making comics. And if you guys have any particular questions based on these studies,
let me know. Uh, I will do my best to answer them. Like I said, I am a student of the craft. I am always learning. These studies are very educational for me. So at this point in this panel, like everything is all tumbling away from storm. Um, night crawlers on the floor tumbling away from storm. I presume the only reason why Avalanche still has his feet on the ground is because he can control Earth and he's probably using his power to somehow stabilize him. The blob has density power, so he's just super dense. Colossus, again, his body is kind of flapping in the air, which, you know, is funny when you think about he's this big, massive guy made out of metal, but he's hanging on to the blob to keep from getting swept away. All right, so let's take a look at the next page in this sequence. I'm going to take these two, I'm going to group them, turn those off. So the next page, wow, okay. So the next page, everyone that uh, was caught up in the fire in that fight is just getting blasted out of the side of the building. Yeah, there's windows, but it looks like they're just getting blown right through the wall. And you've got a... <laughs> and you've got uh, John Byrne making a little political commentary here. And he said, like, because this is all going on at the, uh, at the, the state capitol. Or not the state capitol, the capitol in D.C., the capitol building. And um, there's some people walking by and it says, good grief. That sound. Someone bombed, someone's bombed the Capitol. And some other random one was like, yeah, it was probably the White House that did it. Um, so a little political commentary that he's making there about kind of the rift between the White House and uh, and Congress. Um, and this was, the, what was this, in the 80s? Days of Futures Past came out. I can't remember if it was in, I feel like it was in already in the 80s. I don't, like not to the late 70s, but I would actually have to look and see when exactly Days of Futures Past came out. Um, it might be late 70s, but right? I feel like it was in the 80s. Um, still before I was reading comics. I didn't really start reading comics until the 90s. So loosely locking in, again, the panel borders. Procreate makes it nice and easy. And another thing that might screw up my composition is the fact that I'm just guesstimating. And I might get the height of the panels correct because I'm drawing because I'm drawing these lines. No, I don't want that. Just want to move this over. I might be getting the width of the panels wrong. That's what I'm trying to say. I mean, the width of the page wrong. But again, these are rough studies. It's not super important. What's really important is the storytelling. Now we don't see Wolverine getting blown out of the, the side of the building, but we do see him continuing in this battle on the ground. And even though we don't see it happen, we presume that when these other characters got blown out, you can see that Colossus obviously must have retained his grip on the blob because now you cut to Colossus getting punched out of the building and then blob coming after him to finish the job.
So the point of this is not just studying the composition of the page, but looking, I'd say it's probably just as important, is looking at what are the actions that John Byrne or any master storyteller is choosing to uh, choosing to show in a given panel. So now on this one, you very definitely get the sense that the horizon line is below the uh, below the panel border because we're looking up. We've got the ground here. So I'm going to start by just slightly blocking in the background only because, well, you know, I, I think that that's kind of a, a good point to, to start for most panels, but really it's to divide between the building. That's kind of the backdrop. The ground plane. And then that other building there. So basically, it's almost like I'm separating the sky from everything else, which is something when I've taken classes on doing drawing land landscapes and environments. You kind of want to do at the start is separate. your regions, and then there's usually, it's the sky region and the land region. It's not necessarily that skies are unimportant, but, you know, sometimes those clouds are just as important, if not the most important part of the storytelling. But it's almost like it, it's all about helping you frame the scene. Now, I will tell you that what's going on with the, uh, the building that's in front, I feel like there's some cheats going on. Because if you look at this building front here, and you look at this row that, whoa, put my drawing down up there. This feels like it is on a different plane than if you go over to the building right next to it, it feels like this is changing angles. Like this building is at a, a different arc than this building. So I don't know if that is, I feel like that's a cheat as opposed to something that's intentional, but I don't know. I would have to look at Burns reference. Um, it could be that there's a building that has a front panel that's facing this way. And then you go, a little bit down and it changes direction. It's very possible. But anyway, you've got the major element in here, which is this blast, which is going to be containing characters. It's coming out of the building. So you've got that blast. Yeah, it feels like the horizon is almost below the ground here. So kind of just off of dead center, you've got this figure standing as a foreground. It's like you've got these two characters, which are one set of foreground colors characters, and they're united by color or actually value because they're all they're gray. But the idea is that they're separating the planes by saying these two are on one plane or they're on similar planes because to be honest you get this first character the character that appears closer to us and by the way i think there's definitely some wonky cheating going on because these characters are up this high this character feels closer but they're lower so unless they're a little kid 
they should actually be, if they're closer to the camera, this character should actually be up here. But that would get in the way of our storytelling. So there's a cheat going on. And the only way I think you could get around, here's the problem. You could get around it by saying, oh, well, there's a set of stairs down here. And this character's on a lower plane. Except for the fact that we're not seeing those stairs. I think if you put in a, and I'm not saying, oh, I would go back and do this. I'm not trying to to rewrite the work of John Byrne. The whole reason why I picked John Byrne because he is a genius and he's an artist I highly respect. But I'm looking at this and I'm seeing that this character is down here. You, if you wanted to make this character feel like they were lower, you would need to give a visual cue that they are lower. So let me. switch to white here. Now, if you were to say, all right, here is like a stair rail. And it gave you a sense that this character that's standing there is that you would need to communicate why this guy is lower. Now, to me, it just looks like, hey, he's in a deadline, he needs characters, and he placed that character. I don't think that there's a – I've made decisions before where I look afterwards and I'm like, oh, that doesn't work or it doesn't completely make sense. Um, I've never in my entire life – because I've read Days of Futures Past a few different times. I haven't reread it like hundreds of times. I've read it a few different times. I've never in my life noticed this until now that I'm doing these detailed – analyses. Let me bring this a little bit closer because I realize as I'm talking about this, it may look a little bit hard for you to, to understand. I'm talking about it in vagaries, but I've got the screen pulled out. I should probably pull it in so you guys can actually see just the fact that you know, it's implied by the coloring that uh, these two characters are about the same distance away from the action, the, the characters that are getting blown into the air, and then this other set of characters that are there closer. Because you notice that these characters, this group, you're looking up at all of them, and they're of different heights, but you kind of get the sense that they're on a similar ground plane. Like their their difference in height can be explained by just people being different heights, as opposed to this particular guy. This guy, his difference in height is not explained in comparison to the difference between these two because he also feels a little bit wider or not even wider. They feel like they're about the same size, but he's positioned like he's closer. Anyway, all of that to say, the only reason why I even mentioned that is because I put a line in the center to figure out where to place that guy because he's just off of dead center and he's just below in fact, his head is kind of a bullseye for the panel. Because if you say what's, well, dead center of the panel is right there. So his head is just off of dead center. But kind of like, yeah. Just drop a head in there. And I have to move him over because it's making a weird tangent with the uh, the next panel. These are things I always think about. When you've got a character, yes, I'm constantly worried about tangents. But I'm also worried about tangents with, uh, with panels. So if this line that makes it the leg runs directly into that line that makes it panel border, it's going to be visually distracting. Um, I'm constantly looking, trying to find tangents and squash them out. Um, it's one of the best things I think you can do as a storyteller is develop your skill at finding and eliminating tangents. It really helps, not necessarily with storytelling, but it, it's huge for composition. That's the thing. 
being able to get rid of tangents might not make you a great storyteller, but it'll make your compositions way better. And great compositions make you a better storyteller. So anyway. Got this guy over here. We've got these two figures. And normally I don't start with the heads, but it's easier for me to go head and then say, all right, the torso's here. And then just figure out where their legs end. Because these two, again, as I always say, overlapping, overlapping. These characters. These foreground characters. Are overlapping. And they're not doing anything particularly special. They're just standing there in awe, like, oh crap. Um, it's a mutant, uh, not a mutant massacre, that's a different storyline. But uh, it's a mutant melee. And I'm sure that they have used that in uh, the comic books somewhere in the history. I have, I have read Chris Claremont write, type the words mutant melee sometime in my life. I am certain of that. Couldn't tell you where, but certain of it. Anyway. So you've got these foreground characters kind of framing what's going on. And to be honest, I think Byrne could have gotten away with just doing them as a silhouette. So. And there's this little group of characters down here. And I almost view them kind of like a Greek chorus in the sense that, well, I mean, that's really what the, the characters that are up here are. They're commenting on all of the action and drama that's going on. But anytime you have a, a group of background characters that aren't like your leads, they're like, you know, you want to treat them not necessarily as an individual, where it makes your life easier if you can think of them as a visual unit. And in this case, this second group, only one character is being overlapped by the others. This woman right here, out of this group of characters in the green, only one of them is being overlapped by that front group. The rest of them, you know, all kind of stand on their own as silhouettes. But Byrne does a great job of keeping them feeling separate. So you've got Avalanche, you toss through the air. You've got Pyro getting tossed through the air. Pose is not too dissimilar. Changing them just enough that it's not boring repetition. And again, Burn being so good at just putting simple details on there. I'm not going to draw those details in there. But just putting the, the tanks on Pyro and having his head a little bit on fire. Um, you know, very simple things to make these tiny, tiny figures still read as the characters that they are. Archangel with his wings, you know. It's one of the easiest ones. He's always got his wings. He's going to stand out that way. I drew him a little too big there. I'm going to draw him lower and smaller. And really, it's the wings. You 
then down here. This one's probably the most different pose of all of them because it almost looks like Nightcrawler is in like a Spider-Man pose, like he's sticking to the wall. He's getting the same that's happened to the other guys. It's happened to him where he's, they're all getting blasted. His body just seems to be turned, rotated more towards the viewer. Like his back is more towards us as opposed to the other characters feeling like profiles. And again, that tail. This is a great lesson for me in character design. Because you're looking at stuff like, hang on, I'm gonna just put a little outline around this. Energy that's blasting out. But you're just putting in a little bit of, uh, Really, you can just treat stuff like these buildings, which are simple perspective grids. I'm not even going to bother trying to work out what's going on with that other building that uh, that looked weird to me. I'm just throwing a simple perspective grid on here. In fact, I should create a perspective grid brush and then just drop it, drop a perspective grid into every panel just to make it uh, easy to block in buildings and stuff. Well, actually, I don't even need to do that. Um, Procreate has a perfectly good perspective tool. And I don't use it as often as I should, but I will use it more often going forward. Um, So I do feel perspective is very, very important to the visual storytelling in comics. Um, but point being, all right, what was I going to say? So this is my last little point, and then we'll pick up this page next week, and we'll see if uh, you guys want more of these studies. But uh, the one thing I wanted to note here, aside from the, the action of the characters getting blown out this way, all that action and still action continues to move notice in, in most panels action continues to move left to right angel punching pyro blob punching colossus all of the characters getting punched out by storm blob He's moving into this frame, but he's also coming down to smash on Colossus. He's still moving left to right, still moving left to right, still moving left to right. Um, and that is a Western thing. In, um, in manga, it would be moving right to left. But that is important to notice the flow of all of the movements in the page. I mean, to a certain degree, you could almost start with what's the thing that's moving? So you could have started this whole panel by just drawing, that top panel by just drawing a thrust this way. Like basically the things I just drew there, you could start by drawing what is the thrust, what is the, the major movement of this particular panel. The other thing I wanted to note is how great Burn is at just putting in simple details. Like uh, Nightcrawler, I'm going to put this on another layer because I'm Nah, I'll leave it on there. All right. Tail. Wings. I didn't draw the, the tanks on there because it's kind of hard to see, but uh, Pyro does have a little bit of flame and tanks. Flame. Um, so Avalanche doesn't seem to have any particular special things in his costume. He has, a, he has probably one of the blandest costumes of, of all of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. He pretty much just looks like a, um, a really buff Iron Man with a weird uh, 
costume coloring. But when you talk, when you note the fact of all the little details that all of the other characters have that make them read, it makes it so that you can figure out from their silhouettes who's who, no matter what's going on. And that is also extremely important to comic book storytelling. So we're going to wrap it up here for today. I hope this was interesting. Let me know if you guys want more of these, if you enjoy more of these, if you want to, to see me break down this whole five-page sequence. So I've got five pages queued up that I'm going to do analysis for. And again, the whole point of this is that if you're somebody who has some decent drawing skills, you like doing pinups, and you like doing character pieces, and you're happy with those, but and you want to do comics, but you feel like you are afraid to do interior storytelling. You don't know where to begin with visual storytelling. You don't know how to do comic storytelling. Sitting down and breaking down pages, and I wouldn't necessarily, there are plenty of great contemporary storytellers, but I really think the best thing is to go and look at the, the classic storytellers, the John Burns, the Jack Kirby's, the Walt Simonson's, the, um, the Harvey Kurtzman's, the Alex Toth's. Um, the list goes on and on. But looking at the character, looking at the artists who influenced all of the generations that influenced the generations that are working now, because we're so many generations deep in terms of comic fandom and comic creation. That's not just, oh, look at the artist that influenced my influences. This, you have to look at the artist who influenced the artist who influenced the artist who influenced you. You have to go back like three or four generations now and look at it just because they established the language. There's sort of a sweet spot from about the 60s to the 80s, which I think are sort of like some of the peak comic book storytelling. All right. On that note... Thank you again for hanging out. Um, if you'd like to get additional live streams, live streams that are, you know, even though we went a little longer today, even longer than that, we do two and a half, sometimes three hour. If the uh, if the conversation is lively and we're getting into a lot of stuff and there's great questions, we'll go long. Um, we do a thing on Patreon. We do it twice monthly. We call it Art Book Study Group, where we dig into some of the best art books around. Try to suck out all the knowledge we can. We've got one coming up this Tuesday. It'll be 7 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 Pacific Standard Time. And for everyone who's a patron, there will be links on the Discord server. And there will be links in uh, on, on Patreon for you guys to get reminders to know when, uh, when it goes live. And also we'll have the voice channel open on Discord. So if any of you are watching, you're like, wow, I'd love to ask Jeremy questions live. I'd love to be able to talk to him and chat with him directly instead of typing out questions. We do that on our study group. So you can get all that as well as be able to read my comic books on digital archive, um, being on our Discord server where we share art book, give each other feedback, encouragement, share tips, tricks, processes. I share even more artwork than I post on social media. You get all that for as little as $2 a month. There are higher tiers um, where you can contribute more. You can get more, more higher tier rewards. But all of that, the, the basics, $2 a month gets you in. Head over to patreon.com slash Jeremy. That's patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I. And if you'd like to get a free digital sketchbook, if you'd like to get work in progress, animated gifts delivered right to your inbox, blog posts about what I'm reading, what I'm, what I'm watching, What's inspiring me creatively? You can sign up for my free monthly newsletter at newsletter.jeremy.net. And if you'd like to purchase physical copies of my comics, or if you read traditionally, I mean, if you read digitally on Comicsology or Kindle, you go to amazon.jeremy.net. I'll forward you to my Amazon author page. We can pick up books like my first graphic novel, Eye of the Gods, a psychological thriller about a man cursed with visions he cannot control. You can pick up my most recent comic book, Morningstar. It is Lucifer's Fall from Heaven, told as a Western. It's an eight-issue series. Volume one contains issues one through four. Volume two contains issues five through eight. Both have extensive back matter, character sketches, page layouts, uh, thumbnails, uh, photo reference, and more. And you get all of that at Amazon.Jeremy.net. Links for all these in the description for the video. If you're watching on Twitch, links on the channel homepage. All right, everybody, thank you so much for hanging out. Um, thanks for the great comments. 
Thank you for, for spending time with me. That's it for now. Go be creative.